call to order the 18th meeting of our 2013 Common Council, 14 Common Council year. Would uh, the clerk please call the roll? I'll get it. Wait, wait, wait. I'm here. <laughs> Come on, Gary. Turned on. Okay. The side plug in. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> Let's try to go Watch the Lions game. There you go. <laughs> so who's game? There you go. Okay. Let's try this again. going on here? Oh, I know. <laughs> the participants oh, yeah, moving up. Moving up. Moving up. There we go. It's all my fault. Said I all slept. This is not enough to be in front of when you have it. All this technology. <laughs> Music, please. This will make it fun. Mm -hmm. Fifteen present. Alderman Torn is excused. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next is approval of minutes from our last meeting. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move we put the minutes of the previous meeting, approve the minutes, previous of the minutes. Minute. No, you know it. Second. <laughs> so moved and second to approve the minutes from our last meeting. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? All right. Let's go on TV. 15 eyes. Uh, we have no council appointments tonight. Uh, move on to public forum. That would be Milt Storm. Scott, you signed, right? Milt, can I have your address, please? Yes, yeah, so it's 1736 Marvin Court. Thank you. You'll have five minutes. I would like to thank the mayor and the city clerk's department for giving us citizens a time to speak at these public forums. The reason I chose to speak this evening is to set the record straight. When I read a letter to the editor by a former older person challenging the credibility of our present mayor, she was using, of course, her political savvy and cleverness. I have written letters to the editor for approximately about 40 years. Her opinions were of no value to the city of Sheboygan. When the opinion editor, Pat Pancras, spoke to me of one of my many editorial letters, I informed him that when I, along with my identical twin brother, we did attend the University of Wisconsin Extension Center up there in the Wausau area. That was in 1947, 49, 48. In our English composition book written by two professors from the Columbia University of New York City was a chapter on how to write letters to the editor of the printed media. I learned to use enough words to explain your comments and make sure that they are truthful and factual. Also, I learned that truthfulness is not always beautiful, but then, of course, there is no beauty in untruthfulness. Whether we are rich or poor, it is through our self-discipline and a commitment to the truth that we can restore our city and our county to the number one status that we enjoyed many years ago. Let us celebrate the Christmas season this year, as we did in the years past. Merry Christmas and good tidings, and may the year, year be filled with prosperity and 
Richness. Thank you, Mel. Thank you for those comments, Mel. Wayne Emmer. May I have your address, please, Wayne? Uh, 906 South 15th Street. I, uh, I'm representing the Tavern League of Wisconsin, or Sheboygan County Tavern League here. Um, we are opposed to this uh, public intoxication ordinance that they're trying to pass. Uh, we feel it's going to hurt the individual businesses, and because we have become such a tourist attraction lately, it's going to hurt our waterfront, all of our uh, festivals that we have running. Uh, we, we actually feel that there's enough laws right now to, mm -hmm. to take care of the problem that we have. Uh, they, they, they mentioned they mix drugs and alcohol together. Uh, alcohol is a legal substance. Uh, drugs is not a legal substance. They have a number of remarks in here about drugs comparing them to alcohol, and that it's not right. So thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Brandon Jovanovich. May I have your address, please? West 7911 Center Road, Columbia, Wisconsin. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm here also about the public intoxication. <clears throat> um, I guess I'm not questioning the good intentions that were used to construct this new ordinance, but rather I question the actual need, definitions, and unintended consequences of this proposed ordinance. The need of any new regulation, law, or ordinance should not be examined, but scrutinized and held to the highest standard. It's at the heart of American freedom to only create and enforce laws that must be passed. Banning big gulps may have been considered in New York, but here in Wisconsin, I like to believe that we appreciate personal accountability more so than they. In regards to this ordinance, it appears pretty redundant, as there are already multiple laws against every behavior mentioned in Section 1A2. Um, if there is a problem with enforcing, prosecuting, or escalating the penalties at any of the existing ordinances, it would seem more prudent to alter the existing laws rather than fabricate a new one to address issues that are already in the books. We should also wonder how much vagarity we want to codify into our laws. The lack of any quantifiable test in this ordinance makes us rely on human judgment as the sole means of defining an impaired person. That humans make mistakes is undeniable. The problem is <clears throat> all humans, be they police officers or priests, make mistakes in both decisions and their judgments, personally and professionally. To believe that a vague law will always be enforced only based on its good intentions rather than the language it is written in seems to be a utopian dreaming at best and a gross misunderstanding of both humans and history at worst. The final question I'd like us to consider before this ordinance is voted on is the unintended consequences it may cause. Once again, I'm not questioning the good intentions that were used to propose this new ordinance, but rather the real effect on public perception and then public behavior that passing this law would create. Any law that seems to encourage impaired people not to walk home, then by default seems to encourage them to drive. <laughs> by simply driving, impaired people then prevent a police officer from smelling their breath, looking at their eyes, hearing them slur, or see them stumble in the snow, unless they make a moving violation. I am sure it's not the intent of this ordinance to promote drunk driving, but once again, we're dealing with the reality of the public's perceptions, not the good intentions. At the end of the day, I can't see any reason why this ordinance must be passed. It is repetitious, vague, and punishes a safe alternative to drunk driving. The proposal of this ordinance might have been crafted with good intentions, but we all know what good intentions paved the way to. So thank you very much for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Don Sinclair. Was that Dan? Dan. Dan, I said yeah, that wrong. You're I'm close. Sorry. And your address again, please, Dan. Uh, 434 Penn. Thank you. You have five minutes. <clears throat> um, I guess I also want to speak on the public intox uh, thing coming through here. Um, I know my clientele, I have a huge clientele that comes in from really all over the uh, city, or not city, county right now. I have Milwaukee people coming up, Chicago people coming up. I'm pretty much a tourist destination now. Um, I have a connection with the local hotels where people are walking back and forth. Um, by passing this law, all you're going to do is encourage my people to drive. 
Why would you walk? I mean, you're going to end up going through this drug and alcohol classes. It's ridiculous. It goes too far, guys. There's no common sense to it. We already have enough laws in the book, as everyone else has said. So think about what you're going to do. Just think if one person, a tourist, gets ticketed for walking drunk. I tell you, that's going to go through the tourist community like, you know, hotcakes. And we'll be another laughing stock of the country. So think about what we're voting on. Thank you. At the end of public forum. Next is the mayor's announcements. As the year comes to an end, we see several of our longtime and well serving employees deciding to retire. It's a sad time but we have to honor some of those individuals this evening and give them some recognition. The first one is Chief Jeffrey Herman. Jeff started his career with the Sheboygan Fire Department in 1981 in the position of firefighter. In 1987, he was promoted to acting lieutenant in charge of the fire, or rather the engine company. In 1990, fire lead person. In 1998, fire lieutenant. In 2004, captain. And in 2005, shift commander. And on January 1st of 2010, he was promoted to fire chief, the position that was the highlight of his career. Some of the additional highlights of his leadership within the department include hitting up the Ambulance Service Acquisition Team in 2007 and holding various leadership roles with the International Association of Firefighters Local 483, including president from 1995 to 2005. He also coordinated the defibrillators in the school fundraiser back in 2000. This past July, we had a ceremony right here in the council chambers to swear in the newest first lieutenant. And shortly after the ceremony, Jeff was returning to his office and a call came in on his radio of a person that had fallen off a raft near DeLand Park and was being pulled out into the lake by the current. Chief Herman immediately responded to the bathhouse on Broughton Drive and ran down towards the beach and approached the water. While still in his dress uniform, I think he took a coat off, he jumped into the water and swam out to the victims. There were actually three people in the water, a mother and two daughters, and approximately 150 yards from shore. The daughters were on a raft which began to be pushed away from the shore by the west wind, and while trying to get the raft back to shore, the girls fell out of the raft. Their mother swam out to help them and held on until Chief Herman arrived on the scene. Chief Herman took one of the girls in his arms and assisted the mother and the other girl to shore. From the time of dispatch to the time the family was out on the water, out of the water was six minutes. Chief Herman's quick action and bravery saved the lives of those three victims. It's with great honor and privilege that I provide Jeff with a certificate of appreciation on behalf of the city of Sheboygan for his 32 years of service at the Sheboygan Fire Department. And I also have a special Mayor's Medal of Bravery to present to him as well. Please give Jeff a hand and Jeff, please come forward and accept it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for those kind words, and thank you for this very uh, unexpected honor. Um, appreciate it. Uh, when the mayor asked me to come here tonight, I wasn't quite sure if I wanted to speak. And if I did, I didn't know what I would say. I know, I know some of you couldn't wait for that day that I'd be speechless up here. <laughs> I've been called up to this podium so many times in the past. And I do know what I really wanted to say on a lot of those times and never did, so I guess this is my last chance. Don, you know what's coming. <laughs> you people, you want me on that line, you need me on that line. I may have left out a little bit of that. We've all uh, witnessed some very interesting speeches that have taken place at this podium. I can assure you this is six pages long, but the font is very large and there's nothing about hot dogs in it anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I've also got 745 in the pool at the back of the room for the meeting to end, so I've got to make this quick. <laughs> Truthfully, this is a little bit uncomfortable for me. 
33 years ago, I never dreamed that my career was going to end up here. Uh, the other day, I was cleaning out some things in my office, and I came across an article from when I was inducted into the Softball Hall of Fame. And that article said, there never was a ball player that got more big hits at more crucial times in more big ball games. I think that ability, that gift, has carried me through and served me well in my career as a firefighter. I've always seemed to be on duty for the worst calls, the Prangy Fire, Thonay, Jooms, Landmark, and what has been called the most tragic fire in Sheboygan's history, the day we lost three small children and their mother to an early Sunday morning house fire. <clears throat> For some reason, you always seem to remember the ones you lost and not the ones that you, you could save. Occupational hazard, I guess. I couldn't help, help but think back to all the calls. On March 18th, 2007, as I left the dispatch center, I told the dispatchers, and I think it was Kelly and Alicia, don't call me tonight unless it's really something big. And Alicia had a nickname for me. It was Commander Chaos because when I was working, weird stuff always seemed to happen. Of course, that night they called. And at 3.58 in the morning, I pulled up to the Landmark building just as a door and a couple of windows blew out of the third floor and landed right in front of me on 7th Street. There was fire across the third floor, nearly a city block long. <coughs> We're taught to do a 360 around a building before we give any orders. 7th Street was now impassable. I have 18 firefighters responding to a fire that's going to require way more than 50. And for the only time in my 33-year career, we have no aerial ladder truck in service in the city that day. And like tonight, all I could think of was, I've got to say something. I have to give some kind of order. Well, instincts and training took over, and we stopped the fire that at one point looked like it was going to jump 6th Street and burn all the way to the lake. Maybe because I've become so accustomed to standing up here and being grilled on ambulance issues, or station closings, or replacing personnel, or reorganizations, being up here now is a little bit out of my comfort zone. I guess it's an occupational requirement to be good under fire. My comfort zone has always been responding to the most critical and intense emergencies. My guys constantly kid me that I always seem to be around the action, whether it's being four blocks from Northside Beach in my dress uniform, as the mayor mentioned, when a drowning call comes in, or having somebody suffer a heart attack right in front of me at the Wild Center, or having a serious car accident occur a block away from my house. I don't know if it's a curse or a gift, but I'm sure hoping this stops next year when I take this badge off. <laughs> <laughs> the only expla explanation I have for that is that God puts the right people in the right place at the right time for a reason. Maybe someday there's going to be a master's degree for that. <laughs> 33 years ago, in this very room, with no gray hair, I took an oath to protect and serve my community. I fulfilled that promise. Four years ago as chief, I promised to protect our citizens' lives, property, and tax dollars. I'm proud to say today we are delivering fire protection at a lower cost than we did four years ago. Unfortunately, we have suffered two fire fatalities in the city during that time. The biggest promise I made four years ago was to return each and every firefighter home to his or her family at the end of their shift. I've done that, although sometimes battered and bruised. I don't want to stand up here and bore you with the accomplishments of the last four years. I leave you with a department you can be proud of, one that's headed in the right direction on a good path. We've lowered our per capita cost. We've maintained our excellent response times. We have become a leader in the state in national fire incident reporting, recently hosting a training session for other fire departments. We have completely revamped our public education programs to be one of the most complete and comprehensive in the state. We have developed innovative scheduling to reduce our overtime costs. In 2013, I believe it will be the lowest in the state. 
We have completely re reorganized the command staff, integrating the public education officer, two fire inspectors, a training officer, and a deputy chief into a new hybrid command staff. We have updated all of our fire stations to meet public health regulations and to be gender compliant. We have implemented a new hiring process that has brought us the best candidates we have ever seen while reducing city staff time and liability. In the past, year-end reports were four pages long. Last year, we submitted a year-end report that was 40 pages long and covered nearly everything we do. I was born and raised here. I'm proud of my, sorry, Don's city. <laughs> this city has so much to offer, so many positives. Everyone in this room is a spokesperson for this city. Comments on this council floor, like the one I heard a couple months back, that the real estate market in this city is pathetic, have to stop. Rather, statements boasting our affordable housing are what we need to come from this body. You and the leaders of this city have done an awesome job of assembling a great team of department heads. As a whole, the best that I've been around. Each and every one of them has the city's best interest at heart. However, they can't do it alone. They need your support. It takes a total team effort. I have worked for seven mayors. We have a good one here. Give him the respect he deserves and maybe even a pay raise. <laughs> I can't even imagine how many council members I've worked with over the years. Three generations of Van Akron's for crying out loud. Man, I must have been here a long time. I'm not <laughs> staying around for the fourth, Dave. Sorry for you. <laughs> I always remember we have been put in our positions not for our own benefit, not for our own agendas, but to serve the people. The best part of my job has been and will always be to look on the people's faces when we showed up to help them when nobody else could. I cannot leave without thanking my administrative staff, the 66 firefighters underneath me, and most of all, my administrative assistant, Lisa Horn. They have supported my decisions carried out my orders, and never once complained. To me, anyway. I think they're smarter than that. As I piled more and more responsibilities on them and changed their schedules three times in one year at one time, I, I owe much of my success to all of them. I cannot leave without thanking my girlfriend, Tony. She's the one that's had to put up with me when I got home from all of those meetings when you guys called me up to this podium Tony, four years ago you lost me to this city. Now we can spend every second of every minute, of every hour, of every day together. We all feel your excitement back there. It will be a weird adjustment for me next year. I have held a job for all but five days of my life since I was 12 years old. The only other time I was idle for an extended period of time was when I was out with a broken foot. I was so bored I rearranged the kitchen. There are still some things that haven't been found. So, if you think I've been a pain in the butt up here for you, just look at what Tony has to look forward to. <laughs> I've been approached to run for alderman. So far I haven't had that much to drink. <laughs> so for now, Alderman Boren, you are safe. <laughs> so at the end of the year, time will, has come for me to move on. I look forward to setting my own schedule, to no more speeches, hopefully lower blood pressure. I will not miss all the meetings, not that this hasn't been a lot of fun. I will not miss getting up in the middle of a cold night or being on call 24-7. I am not, however, just riding off into the sunset. I will be doing more of what a firefighters apparently love to do, just driving along the lake, hi Dulce, I know you're watching. Past Third in Michigan, up Broughton Drive, over to Lincoln Avenue, and so on. I'm sorry Alderman Bourne couldn't have been here tonight. I know Alderman Bourne and Versi couldn't wait for this day to come, for me to go an early Christmas present. Please do not insult yourself or sacrifice your integrity by feeling you need to stand and applaud me. It's been a real honor and a privilege to be your fire chief. Thank you.
Thank you, Jeff. Next, we have an, another individual who's been a long serving member at the library, Mark Zafis. Mark started his career with the Mead Public Library in 1998 in the dual role of reference and librarian and cataloger. In February of 2006, he was promoted to the business manager at Mead Library and responsible for budget preparation and building services. And in January of 2011, he was promoted to deputy director at Mead Public Library, adding responsibility for information technology, circulation, and technical services. Prior to working at the library, Mark was a member of the U.S. Marine Corps, where he served as an engineering officer, followed by service as a Marine Reserve officer, where he attained the rank of lieutenant colonel. The staff at Mead will miss Mark's amazing talent, they tell me, that he uh, has a very interesting uh, talent to speak foreign, in foreign accents. From time to time, he'd start speaking Russian, German, Chinese, French, or some other accent. It can be extremely funny and a great way to get everyone's attention at the beginning of a meeting and, and keeping everybody in a, in a good mood. With, it was great honor I provide Mark Zafis this certificate of appreciation on behalf of the city of Sheboygan for his 24 years of service at the Mead Public Library. Mark, please come forward and thank you very much for all that you've done. Mark, I know it's a hard act to follow, but you're welcome to make a few comments as well. After the, uh, after the chief's speech, there's no sense my even trying to, to follow up with that. Um, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, council members, citizens, department heads. Um, it's been a long time, but I've enjoyed it. It's been a privilege to work in your library. It's been a privilege to try to make it a better library every day. Um, I think Sheboygan's on the right track, moving in the right direction now. I think the library is definitely moving in the right direction. Um, thank you very much. Merry Christmas. got a very special announcement for you. I want to remind you that back in, in fall, you passed an ordinance that's going to change the time of our meeting. Uh, in January, all of our meetings are going to begin at 6 o'clock, so it's going to be a while before that becomes a habit, but please st uh, stand reminded. And I also <coughs> want to say Merry Christmas to everyone in the council chambers here and to all of our residents. I hope you have a blessed Christmas celebration and also a happy new year. Thank you. We're going we're gonna to go back to confirmation of council, council appointments. There's a document that we missed, and I'll turn it over to the city attorney. This was dated December 2nd. The honorable members of the council, pursuant to the requirements of Section 7.30 of the Wisconsin Statutes, I herewith submit for your approval the list of nominations for election inspectors for all elections in 2014. The before mentioned section of the law stipulates the manner in which election officials shall be chosen and I tender my appointments as follows to retain as much seniority and experience as is possible while complying with the state law. Respectfully submitted, Mike Vandersteen, Mayor. And then there's the attachment that has the list of uh, election inspectors. Thank you. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to approve the appointments as submitted. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll on appointments? Fifteen eyes. Next, we'll move on to the consent agenda. That'll include items 2.1 through 2.15. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that all RCs be accepted and adopted, all ROs be accepted and placed on file, and all resolutions and ordinances be put upon their passage. Second. It's been moved and seconded. The consent agenda is before us. Under discussion, Alderman Van Akron. Thank you, Your Honor. I need to pull forward uh, number 2.8 for a separate vote. I'll need to abstain. Okay. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to pull forward 2.8. Any discussion on 2.8? Okay, the clerk will call the roll. This is for 2.8. Uh, 
that's right there. Fourteen eyes, one abstention. Motion passes. Now we're back to the consent agenda uh, on uh, 2.1 through 2.15, except for 2.8. Is there any discussion on, on the motion to approve the consent agenda? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? <coughs> motion passes. Next, we'll go on to item number three, reports of officers. Item 3.1 will lie over. Items 3.2 through 3.7 will be referred to various committees. Under resolutions, item 4.1 will be referred to the City Planning Commission. Items 4.2 and 4.3 will lie over. And items 4.4 through 4.10 will be referred to various committees. Under reports of committees, item 5.1 is an RC by Public Protection and Safety to whom was referred RC 82 of 1314 by Public Protection and Safety and resolution number 14 of 1314 by Alderman Carlson recommends passing the substitute resolution. Alderman Carlson. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, move to accept and adopt the, and pass the substitute resolution. Thank second. you for that motion. Second. Is there a second? Second. Second. Or second. Very good. We have a second. Under discussion, Alderman Carlson. At this point, I would like to in, uh, invite up uh, Lieutenant Metalstead and the Chief of Police to come up and talk about this document. Okay. If there's no objection, would the two of you please come forward to discuss this document? Good evening. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you about the public impairment ordinance that's in front of you. Um, before we get to that point, I think it's important that we understand how we got here. Um, starting in 2010, we really tried to uh, drill down and look at our crime and what was driving it. One of the problems that we saw is crime was constant. Crime and disorder were both concentrated <coughs> around the, many of the taverns. Uh, in our city and so those are some of the things that we tried to address one of the first things that we did was start out with compliance checks um, to essentially test licensed establishments to see if they were complying with the liquor laws that were in place we had a 43 percent failure rate uh, one of the things that we tried to do to address that was to work with tavern owners um, to identify business practices that would lead them into greater compliance with that and, and thus try to reduce some of the crime and disorder that we were experiencing. Uh, another one of the things that we did was um, Lieutenant Middlestat here worked with the tavern owners to form a tavern safety coalition. And the idea behind that is really to get the tavern owners A to work together and to work with the police to try to address these issues. Um, and to make sure that best practices, business practices are in place. One of the things that we saw was um, problems with over-serving and, and not recognizing when somebody had too much to drink. And so we um, put tips training into place, so essentially training so that bartenders <coughs> would um, be able to recognize when people are in this situation. Um, <clears throat> really what one of the things that we were hearing as this was going on is that the police department was so focused on uh, the actual businesses, the people engaged in the bad conduct were not being addressed. And so this is one of the attempts that we're making to try to address some of that bad conduct. Uh, I think it's important to note that, again, there's a small, very small group of people engaged in this conduct, and that's really where this ordinance is trying to focus on. Uh, perceptions were mentioned earlier. I think one of the things that needs to be mentioned is that there's a misperception that someone can be cited under this ordinance for being impaired. That is incorrect. This ordinance addresses behavior of the person. 
about. So it takes both things to be present. Somebody has to be impaired and engaged in this behavior. So somebody who is impaired and walking down the street cannot be arrested or cited under this ordinance. It targets behavior. Another one of the important things I think about that, that um, is about this ordinance is that we tried to really approach things from a different way. We've seen time and time again where someone has been cited and we haven't been able to change their behavior by simply citing them. And so what we tried to do is find an evidence-based program that we could use as an alternative to refer people to and if they successfully completed that program then it was our belief that we might be able to change behavior in at least a small part of that population. And if we are able to do that, that I believe will be success. Um, so that's really what the ordinance is about and the steps that we've taken thus far. Thank you for those comments, I appreciate it. Further discussion? Can we keep the chief up there? They should probably stay up here. Chief. Alderman Carlson, Alderman Hammond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, maybe either Chairman Carlson or, or Chief, you guys can help me out. I, it was my understanding that the Tavern League was involved in the formation of this document um, or a part of subsect of there, no? Tavern Safety Coalition Tavern Safety is Coalition. a group that at this point um, is made up of about 75% of the tavern owners in the city. Um, like I said, it's a group that was made up just so when these type of issues come up, we have somebody to work with. Every tavern owner in this city is, is welcome to join that. Okay. Um, next question is, and just reading through the document, um, what are the types of behavior you know, it mentioned you know, originally when this was drafted, it was more of a status offense than just the fact that you were. So maybe some examples of what would cause this, um, you know, or this to be enacted or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, is it stuff that we already have laws on the books for? Um, or, I mean, just help me understand what somebody could. You know. It's for engaging in, in conduct that is disturbing the peace, including but not limited, limited to engaging in obnoxious behavior, acting in an unruly or combative manner, vomiting, creating loud noises to the disturbance of other persons, refusing to follow the instructions of a police officer, refusing to follow the instructions to leave a place of business by the owner, employee, or other person in charge. And so really what it tries to do is address those situations where somebody is causing disorder and either a business owner or a police officer is addressing them, telling them it, it needs to stop, you need to go on your way and, and proceed someplace else, home, wherever you're going, and, and they refuse to do that and continue to engage in that type of behavior. Has this been done anywhere else? And if so, you know, do we have any measurement of whether this has been successful or not? Um, it's been done in, in La Crosse, Menominee, Recently, a couple months ago, Wausau passed uh, uh, a public intoxication ordinance. Um, many of the things that we tried to model this uh, under were, were from an ordinance that was created in La Crosse where they used a program that we're essentially using based on motivational interviewing where they saw over a 70% success rate with people who went through the program did not then re-offend. And then last, um, and this is kind of my ignorance as to the court system, but if we have things like you know, um, disorderly conducts and trespassing and you know, if somebody doesn't leave when they're asked to and things like that, um, could the courts give them the option as to go into one of these programs versus a fine instead of having an ordinance on, or, uh, ordinance on the books to do that um, in order to it's possible if, if there is a program that exists to do that. And so, you know, one of the issues that we, we came into with this is we tried to find a program that we could refer people to. We checked with UW Sheboygan, LTC, um, Family Resource Center. There wasn't a program and nobody was, was willing to put one together and make it available. And so we took on that task to try to deal with the issue. Thank you. Alderman Van Akron. 
Mine's not for the chief. But so if anyone else has something for the chief. Does anyone have a, else have a question for the chief? Thank you very much, Chief. Hello, Alderman Van Akron. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I stand up tonight to, I guess, express my concerns and I guess to indicate that I will not be supporting this proposal as it's written. Um, I have three main concerns and I'm gonna highlight here shortly and I'll try to be brief. Um, bear with me, I do have a bit of a cold that I'm trying to deal with. Um, my first concern is the redundancy of this law. I feel that uh, in the time that we've had to discuss this in our committee, um, there's been different proposals and, and this has been one of my main concerns from the beginning is I do feel that the current proposal does focus on people's behavior um, as indicated in number two under the definition for public nuisance. Uh, in saying that, we have laws that address pretty much all of those behaviors. Um, officers currently have the ability to address those behaviors in a manner of ways, whether it's a written or verbal warning and say it's time to move on, whether it rises to the level of a city ordinance um, and they get a ticket, or it rises to the level of a misdemeanor crime and they go in handcuffs and they go to jail. <coughs> um, we have the ability to address those behaviors. Officers have the ability to address those behaviors currently, whether someone is drinking or not drinking. Um, so the difference here is involving the consumption of alcohol uh, as a factor in these behaviors. Um, so I do feel it's redundant. I don't feel that it's needed. I feel that we have laws that address these behaviors and we need to use those in a manner that um, addresses the problems that we see. Um, in a free society, we don't make laws because we can. We make laws because we need them. We make laws because we have to have them. Uh, this just isn't the case with this proposal. Um, secondly, it was expressed from the beginning that this proposal would be a trigger mechanism to the alcohol education program, which I support. I support the idea of trying to change people's mindsets um, trying to change their behavior, I guess open their eyes to some of the things that maybe they're doing that maybe they don't realize. I, I support the idea of the alcohol education program as an alternative outcome to um, a fine. However, when I asked the city attorney who's here now, um, if the alcohol program could be an alternative to our current laws, he certainly indicated it could. We would have to take the time to amend our current ordinances to allow for the alcohol program to be an alternative in which, again, disorderly conducts, trespassing, damage to properties. If alcohol is a factor, we could amend our current ordinances that deal with that to allow for the alcohol education program as an alternative. So I feel that we do have options, rather than creating a new law, to deal with the behavior and allow for the alcohol education program. And lastly, my, my concern, and I think the most important, and which has been expressed here already tonight, is the possible negative impact for our small businesses. We've had several people stand up tonight and express their concerns. I've had several people call and approach me and express their concerns. And I think we need to remember that's who we're here to represent is the people of Sheboygan, the small businesses here in Sheboygan. We need to try to make things easier for them, not make things harder. Um, again, they've expressed their concerns that if the headline reads, Sheboygan is one of the few communities in the state to have a public intoxication law, or the radio puts out broadcast to that same effect, what is the impact on their businesses? And that's their concern, and I think it's a valid concern, and I think it should be a concern of this council. I think they have a legitimate point, and in, I don't think our purpose here is, should be to take the risk of damaging their businesses. It's hard enough to keep a business afloat here in the city, and we've seen that over the last year. We've seen several small businesses close, and I don't wanna make it harder for them, or even take the risk of making it harder for them. So I guess that's, that's one of my biggest concerns is that they've expressed that concern to myself, they've expressed that concern here today, and I think we need to really take that into effect. We have all other alternatives, we have different ways to deal with this problem, we have an alternative to um, enact the alcohol education program, and again, I do find that it's redundant. So um, I would, I guess, encourage people to <coughs> not support the current proposal, um, and that we look at amending our current city ordinances to deal with, um, again, the small group of people that seem to cause a lot of the problems. So I will not support this as it goes forward, and I would ask that we uh, encourage others to not do so as well. Thank you for your comments. <laughs> Any other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please no, call the roll? I'm sorry, my... Alderman? 
Donahue. Um, and I'm going to speak in favor of the ordinance, and I think my cold beats yours. <coughs> too, so, um, <clears throat> the um, when this uh, ordinance was first uh, brought to public protection and safety, I had some very, very substantial uh, concerns about it. As I said to the chief, you know, this is bringing out this my inner civil libertarian because it did really punish people just for the offense or for the status of being drunk. We have spent considerable time reworking this ordinance so that, to be honest with you, in its current form, it does not resemble the initial proposal really at all. Now, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? That's always a good place to start. The problem that we're trying to solve is in certain business areas, at bar closing time in particular, there are substantial numbers of people who are not only impaired, but they are a public nuisance. Now, what are the, what are the tools that the police department has to deal with these folks? There are certain ordinances that people can be charged with violating <laughs> if their behavior is um, extreme enough to merit, for example, a disorderly conduct charge. As a former prosecutor of disorderly conduct charges, I can tell you that those cases can be relatively difficult to win. It sounds like it's easy, but it's really not. What this ordinance does is take into account the behavior of people who um, actually are not helping our tourist community. These are not the people that we want folks coming to visit our city, walking down the street, or congregating in certain areas, um, engaging in really fairly unpleasant behavior. Now, I'll refer you to the last whereas clause um, of the ordinance, whereas it is the intention of the Common Council that this ordinance be applied only to the extent that other law enforcement measures are unavailable or ineffective in dealing with such behavior. So it's really a pretty narrow scope of the behavior that we're trying to, that we're trying to take care of here. So you get people who are not, probably do not reach the level of, of disorderly conduct, um, uh, which is relatively serious behavior. Um, and yet, these are not the people who are probably really pretty impaired. Um, I'm the parent of now two adult children. And I can tell you that in their day, they probably, you know, walking home, they would certainly have been uh, uh, impaired, but they would not have been public nuisance, at least to the best of my knowledge. Um, so these are the folks who are not only impaired, but they're being troublesome. They're being difficult. They're congregating. It's bar closing time. The food stands are open. People are standing around, and it's difficult for police to control to control the area. So this is, this is one tool that we're giving our police department um, to try to do that. Now, what really has persuaded me that in, in addition to substantially reducing the status offense nature of this ordinance and really connecting it to bad behavior, bad behavior that makes our city look bad, that is, 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 is unpleasant for the neighbors, is unpleasant for the people who don't want to deal with the people who are falling down drunk and, and quite obnoxious. The other piece of this ordinance that really helps is that before a person receives a citation under this ordinance, the person can, will receive a warning. And if the person completes the alcohol education program after receiving that warning, the citation is not issued at all. So in that respect, people who, it provides a public service in trying to point out to people, um, we're, not trying to, we're not trying to cure alcoholism, we're not trying to make this a dry community, but we are trying to get people to understand in this way that when they're engaging in the behavior that they're engaging in, it's really not, it's not good for, it's not good for the community and it's not good for them. It's not good for those taverns, I would, I would certainly suggest. Um, finally, um, because I do, there are measures here for us, for the, for the officers to see if someone is impaired, and those include all of the standard um, um, uh, field sobriety measures of uh, slurred speech, and um, order of intoxicants, um, bloodshot and glassy eyes, and so forth. Um, so. I think that the, the, the application will be narrow. I think that the, the results will be good. The chief is going to report to us on this on a quarterly basis so we can just see what is in fact happening, if this is at all helpful. I will tell you I've spoken to people in La Crosse where this ordinance has been 
um, enacted a very similar ordinance. And of course, their situation is much different. They, have, they do have 50 bars within a three square block area, and they also have a fair student population. There has been, however, after enacting this ordinance, a similar ordinance in 2009, I've seen the statistics, there's been a dramatic drop in the number of unruly and uh, public nuisance kinds of behaviors. The people who go through the program are not reoffending. I mean, it's, it's really a fairly extraordinary statistics. I know it's a different, I mean, we've got students, it's a different population base and so forth, but I think we should give it a try. I think we should see if this makes bar closing time a little bit more civilized and, and just see if this is a good thing, not only for the people who are being public nuisances, but also for our community and, and for the people who live around and for our reputation as a city where, you know, people are relatively well behaved. Thank you for those comments. Alderman Matichek. Thank you. I'm going to have to uh, stand up and, though I do appreciate much that's, that's in this ordinance, uh, there is some quite a bit that is a bit concerning. Um, just um, simply put, uh, an ordinance as to support these small businesses, and when you have this many small businesses coming out in, uh, ag opposed to it, uh, that is a bit concerning as well. Uh, one thing I do have a uh, specific question regarding to the, the warning uh, that is issued, uh, could we have someone speak on behalf of that? Uh, is that directly a warning given out that evening and they would receive the citation as well? And, or is that something that's overseen by the court or is that something overseen by the class? Alderman Carlson, did you want to respond to that? Yes. Uh, the the, it would be no different from um, getting pulled over for um, perhaps a broken taillight. You would receive a warning, and uh, you would have 90 days to complete the, uh, the class, and then you would go into the police department and show completion of the class. And at that point, no citation would be issued. If you did not come in with the nine day, within the 90-day period, a citation would then be issued. Thanks for that clarification. Alderman Matichek. Thank you. And uh, how would we verify whether or not this person has already re received a warning within the evening or within a short, uh, the 90 days that they have? Or w if it would be a second uh, warning, how much staff time would be associated uh, with that to oversee this additional? Any response? Uh, that question I would defer to the uh, chief. Chief, would you like to answer that? Warnings would be given out through our track system, the same as any traffic citation. It would go into the records management system and it would be able to be tracked that way. So very little. It's about running a query and getting back the results. How long does it take? You usually take the staff uh, each and every time to check into that? Like I said, very little. 30 seconds maybe to punch in the query based on the, the codes that are associated with it and get back the data. They would get it, receive a citation. I didn't understand. It, if they got a, if they got a warning and they did not complete the program within the prescribed time, then a citation would would be mailed to them. Should someone be uh, causing a? Uh, should someone otherwise be disturbing the peace in any public uh, place while intoxicated uh, and receiving a warning already? They within the 90 days, if they do that a second time, would they receive a citation or another warning or? They would receive a citation, yes. Citation. Any other discussion? <coughs> Alderman Van Akron. Thank you, Your Honor. Just to follow up on some of Alder Person Donahue's comments, which um, I certainly applaud her effort. She certainly, as she indicated, was uh, pretty vehemently opposed to this at the start and uh, as, as made a lot of changes to um, make this more palatable. Um, some of the things I wanted to touch on, um, again, is, is the intention of this. And I don't think anyone, at least so far tonight, has stood up in, uh, against the intention of this. Um, the bar, the uh, tavern owners that have uh, stood up and expressed their concerns, um, again, are concerned about the perception and what that perception could possibly due to their business. Um, and that's something I think we really need to take into effect when we have other options to create this um, alcohol education program. I think the perception of this um, unfortunately becomes reality. That's, that's the, the world we live in. 
Um, and again, I, I think it has good intentions and I support uh, amending our current ordinances to create an alternative disposition. Um, but I don't support going ahead with this perception that could have that negative impact. And I think we need to remember these small businesses pay their taxes, these small businesses employ people, and is it really worth risking damaging those businesses? Um, that's one of my biggest concerns. And, and again, that's one of the main reasons I can't support this. I also wanted to touch on the Tavern Safety Coalition. There were members of the Tavern Safety <coughs> Coalition at our committee meeting. Um, from my understanding, they've been uh, in creation for approximately one year. Um, it, again, it's, uh, it's approximately 75% of the local taverns that get together um, and have come together to, I guess, start working together to s solve the problem of the small group of people that seem to be a problem for everyone. Um, from my understanding, they have created a, um, basically a banned list that if you are kicked out of one of their establishments, you're kicked out of all of them. Um, again, they've been working together to try to solve some of these problems in conjunction with the police department. Um, and from my understanding, it's been pretty successful. Um, in the last committee meeting, one of the members stood up and said that they've seen a 25% reduction in incidents. I think that's pretty successful in one year. So I, again, I, I really question whether or not we should be going forward with this at the risk of these people's small businesses. And if you'll indulge me, Mr. Mayor, if I can quickly just ask for a show of hands, if we went to amend the current ordinances to allow for this alternative uh, alcohol class under our current ordinances and not this, would you gentlemen be in favor of that rather than this? Can I just see a show of hands? As you can see, several of them would be in favor of that alternative. So again, I question who we're here to represent. There's a large, a large quantity of the people here don't want you to support this and would support an alternative. So uh, I really ask uh, that you don't support this going forward and that we continue to work on it and come up with a different answer. Thank you for those comments. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll on 5.1. Seven ayes, eight noes. Motion's defeated. Next is item 5.2 in RC by public protection and safety to whom was referred RC 83 of 1314 by public protection and safety and general ordinance 8 of 1314 by Alderman Carlson recommends passing the substitute general ordinance. Alderman Carlson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, with that being said, I'd move to file. Second. It's moved and seconded to file. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Change the Does it accept end file? Fifteen eyes. Motion passes. Next is item number six, ordinances. Uh, item 6.1 will be referred to the City Planning Commission. Under matters laid over, 7.1 is an RO uh, number 196 of 1314 by the City Planning Commission. Toomer's referred General Ordinance 43 of 1314, amending the city's zoning map to establish the use district classification of recently annexed property owned by the town of Wilson and located at 4108 South 18th Street to SR3 Suburban Residential. Alderman Versi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to accept and file and pass the ordinance. Second. It has been moved and seconded to um, put the motion on the floor under discussion. Anyone wishing to be heard? If not, will the clerk please call the roll? Fifteen ayes. Motion passes. Next is 7.2 and RO number 198 of 1314 by the City Planning Commission to whom was referred General Ordinance number 45 of 1314 by Alderperson Versi amending subsection 15.936. <coughs> sub one of the city zoning ordinance relating to fees. Alderman Versi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to accept and file and pass the ordinance. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Any discussion? 
Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll on 7.2? Fifteen eyes. Motion passes. 7.3 is a res is resolution number 86 of 1314 by Alder Person Hammond, authorizing entering into a contract with Butine Peterson and Sigma Environmental in order to fill the floodplain in the former Shookard property. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to put the resolution upon its passage. Second. It's been moved and seconded to put the resolution on its passage. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Fifteen eyes. Motion passes. We'll go on to 7.4, which is resolution number 101 of 1314 by Alder Person Hammond, authorizing entering into agreement with Siegel Gallagher Management Company for the management of the Harbor Center Marina. Alderman Hammond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to put the resolution upon its passage. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the resolution under discussion. Alderman Hammond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as many of you guys know, we had a conversation in, in a closed session regarding that um, this um, contract. We did go back to Siegel Gallagher with many of our uh, thoughts and recommendations. Um, uh, Attorney McLean, if you wouldn't mind just real briefly going through the changes to the contract um, that were made um, that from what we talked about in closed session and then um, so the council understand. Thank you. Alderman? Rather, uh, city attorney? Promotion. Ooh. Got promoted there. Huh? <laughs> uh, two, two major items. One is the uh, term of the contract. I think originally the discussion was three-year term. Um, and discussed and negotiated to be a five-year term. And I would say that that's consistent with what we, uh, we've always had five-year contracts with Skipper Buds uh, over the last 20 years. They were been five years and uh, a couple of them had possibility of five year extensions. Uh, this has a possibility of an extension at the city's uh, uh, insistence. Um, and the incentive fee is, is a, a change from uh, what was discussed previously um, the uh, the management fees, since it was uh, converted to a five-year contract, <coughs> section 14 speaks of base management fee beginning in 2014 at 60,000, uh, and then that goes up $5,000 a year uh, for each of the five years. So it's 60, then 65, then 70, 75, and 80 in 2018. Uh, that's the base management fee. Then throughout the term of the agreement, there's an incentive fee uh, that <coughs> is paid for 2014 and 2015. The incentive fee would be based on 35% of the revenue increase from net new boat slips over the previous year, excluding any increases that are due to cost of living type of increases. For 2014, the base used to calculate that incentive is uh, $373,277, which is uh, the revenue, I understand, revenue we received from slip rentals for 2013. So uh, basically that incentive fee is for the first two years, 35% of the revenue increase on the net new boat slip rentals over the previous year. Then for the uh, balance of the five-year term, the remaining three years, the incentive fee would be 20% of the uh, revenue increase from net new boat slips over the prior year. Um, there's a disincentive fee put in that would be applied if Siegel Gallagher, Gallagher failed to meet the budgeted net operating income by 20% or more in that year. And the disincentive is that the base management fee would be frozen on a going forward basis. Uh, there are some other changes to the, basically the contract otherwise is similar to what we've got had over the years with Skipper Buds. 
Uh, one sort of administrative change is uh, the way the Skipper Buds contract worked was Skipper Buds would uh, provide invoices and get their bills and so forth and submit them all to the finance department. The finance department would, would pay everything out of an account. Uh, under this proposal, basically Siegel Gallagher will have the bank account. They will uh, collect the revenues in an account on behalf of the city and pay the bills. Uh, <coughs> and there'll be an accounting on a monthly basis of the revenues and expenses. And then any net revenues would be turned over to the city at the end of the year. So that's more of an administrative change than a substantive change, but it's, uh, it should make it easier for the finance department. Uh, I think, I don't know if uh, Chad or Nancy or Bernie uh, or David has any other comments, but I think those are the basic changes since this was discussed by the council previously. If there's no objection, I'd like to open up the floor to John Matheson. So move. Second. Moved and seconded to do so. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And John, I understand, uh, took his life in his hands to come up here in the snowstorm today and uh, a lot of traffic down in Milwaukee. John, welcome. Thank you very much. That was no fun, coming up from <coughs> two hours and 30 minutes from Milwaukee. So um, thank you. I uh, appreciate you inviting me. And um, I'm John Matheson with Siegel Gallagher Management Company, one of the principals with the company. And um, I have been with Siegel Gallagher for about 11 years. I've been a boater for 18 years. We uh, took over managing Reef Point Marina in Racine in the spring of this year. And it's been a very successful relationship with them so far. And um, it's something that we're very excited about uh, doing the same here in, in at the Harbor Center Marina. I think we have a real good plan to get there. Um, were there any specific questions? I, I'd be happy to kind of give you a general overview of, of our um, kind of our strategy to do so. Um, if that, if that, I'll, I'll, all right, I'll just take a minute and go through that. Um, we don't sell boats. We're strictly a customer oriented uh, and a service oriented company. We focus very, very heavily on that. We have our infrastructure and systems set up to do that using latest in technology, um, web-based programs, um, internet, uh, social media to, to not only make it um, easier for boaters to communicate with us and also do make payments and, and administrative work, but also market the marina. Uh, the second thing that, that we think is different and, and that helps us is that we're heavily focused on, on the community, and that is uh, creating and fostering a better relationship with the local businesses and the marina, which is, as all of you know, one of the main assets of this marina is that proximity to the local <coughs> community, and we don't feel that that has maybe been um, played as, up as well as it could be, and uh, we think that's a major area of, of focus for us going forward um, to help grow the marina, which is really the goal here, and that is to get more, more boaters in the marina um, and help the financial, uh, the, the revenue, and, and the bottom line of, of uh, the marina so it can um, be more profitable, it can invest in itself more, and also maybe even begin paying back a little bit of what the marina owes the city. That's the, the short story of how, uh, what our strategy is. Any questions by the alderman? John, one of the things that's been particularly difficult about this negotiation is that we've got some very strong individuals that work for Skipper Buds in the past. And I'm just wondering what your plans are with personnel and, and staffing of the marina as the operator if we approve that. Good question. Chris Marks has been with uh, Harbor Center Marina for 15 years, and I've spent quite a bit of time with him um, several hours last week, and he was at our company party uh, this past Friday. Uh, with him and his wife, and um, I, I think there's a real good um, match in what he he can bring to us as a company, what we can bring to him, and and help him achieve. 
uh, he has a lot of good ideas that um, he, he uh, probably wasn't able to implement um, in his position in the past. The way our company works is it's a collaborative relationship with our staff. Chris would be a, a, a major part in helping define and execute that strategy as well as some other folks um, in our uh, marina side, uh, even collaborating with um, Reef Point and that staff and working on, on ideas to, to help uh, get to our goals. Our company is, um, is nimble enough in that area that we're able to not just take a, a model and force it on this marina, but really design a strategy very specific to Harbor Center Marina. And Chris knows the marina, he knows the boaters, he knows the market, and he would be able to, with our support, uh, to execute a, uh, maybe a better strategy to help get that done. So to, to answer your question, um, the four key players in the marina are gonna remain. Um, we're gonna continue to do boat, to do service on boats. We're gonna continue to do the haul outs and storage as have been done in the past. And Chris will still be running the show there, but he'll have um, more support, I think, from us. And it'll be a very collaborative effort with myself and, and a couple other people as well. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? John, thank you very much for making the trip up today. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. There's no other discussion. We have a motion on the floor. Uh, Alderman Van Akron. Thank you, Your Honor. I guess just a question on the increase in term um, from three years to five years. Uh, I, I did um, appreciate the fact that there is incentive-based um, <laughs> I guess there's incentives in place as well as disincentives in place based on the income and how it increases or decreases. My question is, is if, and, and I certainly am hoping that it's not, um, and, and by no means am I indicating that it's going to be, um, but my question is, if, if somehow this goes very badly, um, it, it's a catastrophic failure, do we have any options of getting out of that uh, agreement within that five years? City Attorney? Uh, there are termination provisions in the contract. Uh, basically, uh, termination by the city uh, provides if more than, if one or more of the following events occur, the city may terminate the agreement by notice to Siegel Gallagher. Uh, basically, if they're in material default in the performance of any term or covenant <coughs> of, in the agreement, uh, we would have to give them 30 days advance notice, an opportunity to cure. If they fail to cure uh, within a 30 day period, we could uh, <coughs> get the contract there based on default by the, by the marina manager. Um, if they were to file bankruptcy, uh, if they're, They made any misrepresentation to induce the city to enter into the agreement that's false in a material respect. Uh, if they fear, fail to meet the yearly budgeted net operating income two consecutive years, we have the right to terminate. Uh, and in the event we're able to uh, terminate City could exercise any or all of the following remedies in addition to termination. The city could, uh, uh, without further notice, enter onto the marina premises and expel the, uh, the manager if necessary and remove their effects and uh, require the manager to turn over the slip uh, leases and the boat rental uh, agreements, similar agreements, and so forth. Uh, so that's basically our termination rights. It's similar to most contracts. It's a for cause sort of termination. I guess just to clarify then to follow up, if, if they don't meet those those budgeted uh, net income, I, I guess is how you phrased it, if they don't meet those two years in a row, we would have that option? Yes. Is that correct? Okay. I guess with with that being in place, then I, then I would support uh, the motion going forward. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, exciting new things that they bring on board, and I certainly am hoping for the best and hoping that this is success, uh, successful as it's being uh, proposed, and um, I will support it going forward with that clause. Thank you for those comments and questions. Any other discussion? 
Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll on passage. Motion passes. Next is item 7.5, resolution number 102 of 1314 by Alderperson Hammond Carlson, approving the capital improvements recommendation for the capital improvement from the Capital Com Improvements Commission for the period of 2014 through 17 and adopting the program uh, for 2014 for implementation. Alderman Hammond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move we put the resolution upon its passage. Second. It's moved and seconded to put the resolution upon its passage. Is there any discussion? Alderman Hammond. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just to clarify, you know, to clarify a little bit, we've uh, been embarking over the last uh, couple of years um, <coughs> you know, in what I'd like to call some future planning. Um, so as you see before you, we have the capital requests from 2014 through um, 2017, and the idea was to kind of give the council an idea of what is coming up on the horizon from a capital standpoint. So what we're approving tonight is, you know, again, the baseline of the 27, you know, the plan, but in particular, the 2014 plan um, uh, as indicated here um, for capital improvements. But again, just kind of gives you an idea of what we're looking at um, 2015, 16, 17 um, for capital improvements and some of the things that are, are being requested and need to be done. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll and passage. Motion passes. Next is, I, resol, is item 7.6, which is resolution 103 of 1314 by Alder Pernison Hammond, Carlson Donahue, Heideman, Vanderweel, committing the fund balance committing the fund balances in accordance with Gatsby 54 and subs of resolution number 44 of uh, 12 of 13. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to put the resolution upon its passage. Second. Been moved and seconded to put the resolution on its passage. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Motion passes. 7.7 .7 .7 is resolution number 104 of 1314 by Alder Person Hammond, Carlson, Dassler, Heidemann, and Bellinger to authorize a transfer of appropriations in the 2013 budget. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to put the resolution upon its passage. Second. Moved and seconded to put the resolution upon its passage. Is there any discussion on the resolution? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Motion passes. Next is item 7.8, resolution number 105 of 1314 by Alderperson Hammond, Carlson, Donahue, Heidemann, and Vanderweel to authorize a transfer of appropriations in the 2013 budget. Alderman Hammond. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor. I move to put the resolution upon its passage. Second. Moved and seconded to pass the resolution. Is there any discussion on the resolution? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Motion passes. Next is other matters. City Attorney. Eight point one. It's an RO by the Board of Contractors Examiners uh, submitting applications for building contractor licenses already granted. That will lie over. Eight point two is an RO by the City Clerk submitting various license applications for the period ending June 30, 2014, and June 30, 2015. That'll be referred to law and licensing. 8.3 is an RO by the city clerk submitting various license applications. That will also be referred to law and licensing. 8.4 is an RO by the director of planning and development submitting a request requesting that the Marina Parks and Forestry Committee make a recommendation of the Public Works Committee relating to naming of the new interurban trail recently constructed with non-motorized transportation pilot program funding and city county funding from Penn Avenue to Martin Avenue. Now we refer to Marina Parks and Forestry. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to convene in a closed session under the exemption provided in Section 19851E, Wisconsin Statutes, for the purpose of deliberating regarding the proposals for management of Harbor Center Marina, including the terms, conditions of the management agreement, and deliberating the possible purchase of public property and the possible sale of public property where competitive and bargaining reasons require a closed session. Second. Although to that, I'll amend that, um, we will not be discussing the Harbor Center Marina as part of that. It'll just be the sale and purchase. Okay. Second. And moved and seconded to go into closed session. Will the clerk please call the roll? We'll stand adjourned for five minutes and reconvene. <laughs>